I'm Josée Drumprisbois, Senior Curator of Contemporary Art at the National Gallery of Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that the National Gallery of Canada is located on the unceded and unsurrendered traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We honor and thank the traditional keepers of this land. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Quende Kefense, who's currently the Executive Director of CKCUFM and lead host of Time Code, one of Ottawa's most legendary independent club nights. Quende is here to talk about Platforms, the program he has developed to activate Capsule, an artwork by Rashid Johnson, currently installed in the gallery's main entrance. I thought we could start with just you talking about yourself. You're an urbanist, director of the CKCU, you have worked for City Hall, are well known as DJ Mimetic, and are a community leader. Can you tell us a bit about your background and experience living and working in the cultural sector in Ottawa? And so I grew up in an Afro-Caribbean household. And when I came here, um, and I should, backing up, I should say that, you know, growing up in a household like that, uh, culture is something that uh, is a part of everyday life that I don't think I really appreciated. I mean, or I should say I appreciated it, uh, but I didn't really understand it as a sector that I could be like working in at the time. It was really uh, something that was uh, a part of everyday life from the food that we ate in particular, the music and sort of the way that the music that we listened to and in particular, the special way that we would uh, gather and congregate around music uh, in the GTA with a caravana and a whole range of other sort of like, uh, um, uh, sort of, yeah, just all kinds of different kinds of like social gatherings and different kinds of age groups that all focused around music. And so this was something that uh, I looked at as more of a lifestyle thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older uh, and came to school uh, to, to Carleton to really focus on uh, understanding sort of Western civilization, I did my first degree was in the humanities. That was where I started understanding that, oh, yeah, like culture is like a and there's an in, there's an industry side of it as well um, that I could participate in, and as much as I participated in the lifestyle components as a musician and sort of like DJ and performer and collector of music. And so, uh, when I came here 20 years ago, uh, I was really as a student just trying to understand uh, how to find my place as it relates to you know culture writ large as not just lifestyle, personal lifestyle, but as you know, industry where someone could potentially earn a living and, mm. you know, have a fulfilling career or something like that. And, you know, through that time um, from 2001, you know, going forward, I just continued to make relationships um, and educate myself and, and make connections, uh, um, you know, both, uh, yeah, within the cultural sector and then in other sectors that I was looking into that I was learning about, and in particular, the city and the world of urbanism and sort of managed to sort of bring those two things together in 2010-ish when I started working for City Hall doing cultural development work and planning. So doing work, uh, developing cultural strategies for the city and the municipal cultural sector, so local arts sector. Um, and that really sort of, that was the beginning of getting deeper into the world of culture uh, and sort of, as you said, sort of the, uh, the cultural sector and the cultural industries more broadly. And one thing just sort of led to another, like as that was happening, sort of as a, within the context of my, uh, I guess, day job-ish, I guess you could <laughs> call it that. You know, there was another thing that was going on in terms of my own creative practice as a DJ and producer, which was something like, as I said, that was more of a life that was more of a lifestyle thing for me. But that even that was starting to uh, take shape as um, as something that uh, I was that, that was growing that I was growing more professional at, and that even that even that started to have its own industrial quality. We started to understand our role in the local you know, music industry and the local music ecosystem uh, through starting things like Time Code and participating in DIY club culture uh, in Ottawa, which is, a, which is a really thriving thing around, you know, in the early 2000s, 2000 to 2010 in particular. Um, and so, yeah, you know, 
it's been a journey that evolved, you know, from that time. And, you know, a lot of it has just been uh, has just been continuous from there. You know, I spent a lot of time with the city. I was there from 2010 to about 2020, mm. um, doing a lot of different things from cultural strategy stuff to music strategy stuff to working with other organizations like the film office. And I focused in on cultural industries when I worked with the city. Um, and then with time code, you know, that was a project that started in 2005 and was stopped basically only by the pandemic. And so we had like a, a, a really, uh, a strong continuous run of parties for about 15 years every month, uh, bringing a, a huge diversity of people together. And then also, uh, bringing performers from around the world to Ottawa, uh, to perform and to connect with, uh, people here. And so, yeah, it's been a really interesting uh, time, you know, over that. And somewhere amidst all of that, I also went to school in the UK. Uh, I picked, as I mentioned, you know, I connected sort of this urbanism and city space to music and really dug into that intersection and then went to, uh, to the Bartlett School of Architecture to pursue uh, that uh, intersection even further. Uh, and it was mm -hmm. when I came back from that that I changed careers from being at the city to being at CKCU, uh, which is uh, a, seems like a I know it might seem like a left hand turn uh, from uh, from working at City Hall, but sort of considering uh, my interests and the sort of relationship between um, you know uh, being engaged with local communities, being engaged with music, being engaged with sort of the city at large. Uh, yeah, it seemed like a good fit for me. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm glad to be there. Oh, that's great. No, thank you so much. And uh, I mean, you touched a lot on many things that, are, that I'm absolutely curious about. And one of them was from a talk that I saw that you gave around a social configuration of space. And it really dawned on me how your interests in that and urbanism, uh, you know, and are mixed with your interest in music and being a producer. And, and I wonder if you had any more thoughts about that specifically, how, how those two interests really intersect. Yeah, I mean, it was something that started, uh, it was funny, I was talking to somebody about this very recently, um, about the fact that, you know, one of the things that pushed me into developing this intersection of interests was um was a film course that i took many years ago strangely enough called cinematic cities and it was something that allowed me to really look at cities from uh, a really a, a, it, it opened up you know a really different a really wide range of perspectives for looking at the city and it allowed me to sort of connect some dots between uh sort of one of the cultures that was really formative for me vis-a-vis hip-hop culture and the origins of hip-hop culture and sort of the origins of the modern city as it emerged in the post-World War II era. And these seem to be very disparate thoughts in some respects, but it was, these were thoughts that I was living in that, like, you know, I was really DJing and producing hip hop music and thinking about the culture. And at the same time in these courses, looking at the beginning of the city and sort of these, you know, being living in that intersection just made these thoughts uh, start to come together. And so, uh, you know, it, it, like I said, I started pushing myself to really explore the intersection of how um, culture emerges from space and the relationship between uh, a spatial culture and cultural expression. And, uh, and that was really what led me down the path to learning about something called space syntax, which is mm -hmm. sort of like a theory and methodology for analyzing um, sort of, uh, what do you call it? Um, I guess I guess one one way of framing it is that's a social theory of space and a spatial theory of society. Hmm. And so it looks at society as something that expresses itself spatially and that it also looks at space as something that's actually social and that we use to configure our social relations. And then there's a mathematical component to it, which allows us to actually break that down um, into sort of statistical relationships and, hmm. you know, learning about. Uh, and sort of, <laughs> I guess, learning about that and connecting all of that to hip hop culture, um, you know, 
it was unusual and that was why I got asked to to do a talk about it and um and I guess that was what you saw was yeah that that specific talk at ICEA where uh yeah where we where we were sort of problematizing that and starting to think about um I think the theme of the conference was machine wilderness so it was looking at this relationship between space uh and technology and society and that's right and we were looking at, uh, and when we talked about wilderness, I, I was really looking at sort of this new uh, iteration of the city that hip hop emerged out of and, mm-hmm. and making that connection there. So, yeah, there's always been this really, for me, there's been this uh, connection that I've been sort of cultivating over, over, the la- over a, a while, uh, both as it relates to like my, uh, yeah, my creative practice and my academic interests. Mm-hmm. I, I have to say it's really interesting to see you in capsule and to think about that space as a social space. And uh, I think just through our conversations, it's really opened my eyes because of course I see it as a sculpture and installation. I see it as a work within the museum, um, but the museum is also situated in a city. And yeah. what does that mean in terms of bringing this gridded in- installation within that context as well? Um, and Rishi Johnson was, you know, very interested in the radical gesture of uh, populating this minimalist sculpture, you could say, with uh, so many different objects that have cultural significance, that are objects that relate to his life. Uh, so you can, you know, consider that piece as a, a self-portrait. But it's also an armature. And uh, that to me is really interesting because it kind of leads to this idea of the platforms, uh, the title of your series, and, and kind of like how the sculpture functions in and of itself. But I see the work as uh, challenging the museum, challenging its history, uh, the reference to minimalism that I talked about. Um, and, you know, that's a very strong influence for, for the artist. And looking at Sol LeWitt, for example, and his open cube sculptures, looking at Carl Andre as mm-hmm. well, and Dan Flavin with the, uh, the light as, uh, all throughout the sculpture as well. So there's some really, really strong art historical references. And at the same time, right in the heart of the piece, there's a platform that is there to, to be animated, to be activated. And this is where your program, your program comes in. And I'd love to hear you talk about your vision for the series. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, as you, you know, as you were describing so many of these influences and the ways in which uh, the structure intervenes in the space and creates, you know, this, uh, yeah, a, a whole range of different moments within the gallery as you, as you interact with it. Um, You know, I I think that uh, what I want from, or what my goal for the series is, is just to engage people both um, or engage the school, engage the, engage different communities and engage the sculpture uh, and the object um, in a range of sort of radical intersections, not unlike Mm -hmm. what, uh, the purpose of all of these pieces being together in the sculpture is in the first place, and not unlike sort of what the way I inter- what I interpret uh, uh, a city, uh, or, or I guess I, I interpret those radical intersections as one of the great values of cities and urban life. And so, you know, I'm sort of trying to bring some of these ideas together through some of my. Uh, um, my world of practice through my world of um, sort of academic interests um, and through some of, uh, you know, uh, my his some of the history uh, and, and, and context that I've built uh, within the city around some of my practices and academic interests and, and also with some partners. And so uh, we have, uh, I'm really excited to be working with a range of really talented people uh, to bring some of these ideas to life in terms of how we can engage this sculpture to engage different voices and different mm-hmm. people in the city uh, as we think about sort of what it, and it's an, I think it's also something that's really uh, prescient right now as we're coming out of this pandemic and we're thinking about different ways of being together. 
uh, one of the things that I'm also looking forward to is just bringing people together around this sculpture and around this object to be able to think about it in different ways through the conversations that we're going to have and through the activations that we're going to be doing here. Some of them creative, some of them uh, consultative, uh, some of them conversational. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, at first, so the first capsule or the first platform, rather, I should say, that we're going to be working on uh, focuses on Black music and innovation. And we're going to be working with Alana Stewart, which I'm really excited about. Her and I have a long history together. Uh, she was one of the original people who started Time Code way, way back in 2004 and 2005. And she's gone on to do a lot of really incredible work focusing on, I mean, creative work, of course, uh, with Bon J and done her solo work with, and also her work with Queer Songbook Orchestra. Uh, but then also she's been doing a lot of great stuff, uh, focusing on uh, a lot of academic work on dancehall culture and focusing on sort of the influence of dancehall culture and the role of dancehall culture uh, in musical innovation. And that's something that I've always been fascinated by as somebody from the Caribbean, as I mentioned, sort of the musical culture of the Caribbean and the sort of uh, culture around the music in the Caribbean has always been something that's fascinated me and that was really inspiring to me. And, you know, one of the things that's amazing about this installation is that there are so many different influences from the plants that come from the African diaspora uh, to the books that focus on different components of Black life in North America. And, you know, it inspired me to reflect on sort of how some of those influences relate to me personally. And that was part of why I started bringing some of these influences together to explore this theme. You know, Black music and innovation are things that have been really, uh, that have been driving forces for me. And I know <clears throat> that have also been driving forces for Rashid from the conversations mm -hmm that we've had and through what I'm interpreting from this installation. And so we're gonna be starting it off with um, a really exciting conversation um, with my man, Bear Witness from The Hallucination, who I also have a long history with in the DIY club uh, scene of Ottawa, as I mentioned, between sort of two, 2010 or between sort of 2005 and 2015 in that 2010 era, there was a lot of stuff going on, including the emergence of electric powwow, and the emergence of uh, Bear's original group and, uh, and the musical style that they sort of crafted around themselves. And <clears throat> one of the things that we're going to be discussing, which I'm really excited to discuss, is the relationship between Caribbean musical innovation and Indigenous musical innovation in Canada. Because, you know, it's something that I think as Canadians, we sometimes, I mean, I know I took it for granted. Mm. And it's something that I'm really interested in. Uh, and exploring how that intersection has created something really new and powerful as it relates to uh, international music and what that means in terms of the solidarities between the communities. Um, and then, you know, Alana and I, and, uh, and you know, we're gonna be doing a creative session uh, where we do an in-studio uh, creative session from inside uh, here. Uh, we're going to be creating some music uh, and, yeah, developing some, you know, uh, some rhythms and, and dance hall stylings with some special guests uh, as another session that uh, that's part of the first platform. So excited about that. Following that, we're going to be doing a session with uh, the Social Planning Council, and we're going to be looking at the relationship between sort of spatial cultures and social cultures uh, in Ottawa, and we're going to be working uh, to use some GIS and to gather folks together to have some critical conversations and generate some critical data about uh, about sort of this relationship between uh, communities who are seeking access, seeking equity uh, in different ways in the city, and the ways in which we can look at those uh, those points of connection between those communities and between. Uh, and, and I guess use data to draw some of those connections between mm -hmm. sort of uh, the needs and, and the existing state of things. And so, you know, we are working together to sort of uh, formulate this right now. So it's a little bit, um, yeah, there are, there are still a few pieces uh, that we are solidifying in terms of the groups that we're going to be working with and how we're going to be rolling it out, but it's, we're really excited about it. And then the third platform, which will be coming in the summer, and we're hopeful that 
the uh, good weather and that all of our good behavior as it relates to COVID <laughs> will allow us to be doing some more fun things with this third platform, but it's really focused on ecology and DIY club culture. And we're gonna be mm -hmm. looking at a range of DIY spaces, DIY space operators, people who have been uh, representing and doing a range of different, uh, uh, and hosting a range of different spaces to bring people together in radical ways in the city um, and really exploring sort of what their role is in the social ecology. And this comes from, you know, one of the books, actually specifically from one of the books that's in this installation, which I was really, uh, I was really intrigued by, which I hadn't gotten into before I saw it. It was the Deleuze book about uh, rhizomatic ecology. And, you know, that's really about the ecology of underground roots um, uh, and uh, mushrooms and this whole sort of fungal um, uh, underground culture and the role that it has in, uh, and producing all so many of the things that we see mm. above grassroots. And it was inspired, you know, that metaphor is really inspiring for me in terms of thinking about some of the work that I've been doing over the last little bit, but not just me, so many people in the city uh, have been doing work to sort of cultivate this kind of community that we have and mm -hmm. so much of it is underground. And I thought it was be an interesting opportunity to bring some of that to light. And we're looking forward to working uh, with some of uh, some colleagues of mine uh, from overseas uh, to bring some of that to light and not just here in Ottawa, but really make the connection between things that are happening in Ottawa and things that are happening internationally as well. I love that idea of the rhizomatic thought um, and Deleuze and Guattari specifically, their interest in all the things that are happening underground and we don't know where they're going to pop up. We actually don't know how everything is connected. And I know that that was a big influence on Rashid um, and specifically with these grid sculptures. The first one was actually called a thousand plateaus and plateau could be interpreted as well as a platform here. Of course, yeah. Um, and relating to that idea of like how things are connected. So when you have a sculpture that has so many different objects that seem completely unrelated and then you can start to make these connections and relationships between these objects you're making meaning and yeah. that's something that you know again it will be completely different for different people as the the objects themselves can relate to different you know past experiences or different uh, theoretical um and as well for the artist it was uh quite interesting for him to think about making a work that had so many layers, like from emotional to literary to intellectual to musical. Um, so I'm, I'm so happy to see like a whole other layer kind of appearing with the activations and thinking about how those things relate. Um, and one thing that I come back to often, because it, it just find like it's such a, a good metaphor to think about capsule as a brain. Yeah. Um, and, and that idea that, you know, it's, it's also how things are connected. So we have the wires are all showing and, you know, nothing is hidden yeah. because it's also about the kind of like the, the underground, but also how everything operates. And he talked about art as, a, or he talks about art as a delivery system, which can, through the amplification of voices, be a tool for change. And I love that idea of like taking that really on. And I think I don't want to speak that we're doing something radical, but I do think we're doing something radical by by extending that and uh, and making it even more um, about that invitation for different people to talk and to to have different points of view and to to share. Um, so I'm super excited about your your program. I think uh, it's going to be really interesting to to see it blossom, <laughs> grow. Yeah. <laughs> No, thank you. And I think like, you know, to your point, you know, I think that there's also something special about this installation in terms of the way that it allows you to not just observe it, but walk through it, be under it, um, participate in it spatially in a really unique way. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that that, you know, as you said, it creates an invitation through the way that it's through the way that it's structured to be bringing people in and out and through the space. And as I said, you know, what we're hoping for is that by the summer, we're gonna be able to have more people in here moving through the space and experiencing 
this installation in a number of different ways, not just, you know, and I, and I mean that not just in terms of, you know, seeing it through the window or even being able to uh, pass through it, but then also to be hold of, to be able to par participate in events here um, where they're able to engage with it in even more radical ways in terms of, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, it being uh, a part of the way that a centerpiece of, 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 of the way that we celebrate or come together in, in different kinds of ways. Um, yeah, and I, I'm super interested in the idea of the public space as well. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in some of the conversations we've had, we talked a little bit about that, the radical, but also about the radical co-presence. And yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, what that concept means to you. Uh, I mean, to me, I mean, and, and a lot of that goes back to what I was saying before uh, about some of the inspiration of my youth in terms of, um, you know, seeing things like Carabana and crop over and these sort of bacchanalian uh, temporary autonomous spaces. And I, you know, I think that, um, you know, being able to, and, and, and I, and I would say that even with respect to time code, you know, part of what we do and as much as we DJ music, we also, you know, a big part of what we would say that we do is create a space and create a space where people can connect in this way that they wouldn't usually connect in normal everyday society. And it allows them to, for whatever reason, break down barriers or be mm. able to make, make that connection because there's an art, there's, uh, uh, as I mentioned, as I said before, there's this um, radical co-presence and people are there, you know, for, you know, the reasons that people are there may not be exactly the same, but mm -hmm. the idea is that, you know, in general, we're all here to enjoy ourselves. And that as, uh, as an impetus and as a, and as a point, as a departure point for any conversation or interaction that you're going to have some with somebody, um, you know, puts you in a better position to be able to connect. And I think that, you know, that's really in its own way is really radical. And I think that mm -hmm. that's what's really fun about, uh, about parties, about, uh, about being able to create that space uh, mm -hmm. where people come together uh, you know, with that focus on enjoying themselves. And then through that, they're able to actually make these, you know, radical connections that they uh, really wouldn't in any other scenario. I know personally, I've had so many um, different experiences in those types of scenarios where, you know, when I reflect on it, it's like, what was I doing there? Like, <laughs> you know, like what other, what, in what other situation would I meet these people? But, you know, mm. those people really enriched my life in a number of different ways, not just through, you know, that one experience. And so when I think about that radical co-presence, I think about it in terms of, you know, creating a space mm -hmm. um, where that uh, where that autonomous where that uh, where that autonomy creates a real, you know, allows us uh, allows for a great amount of social potential. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about Rashid's piece. I mean, you, you talked a little bit about like how it resonated, but specifically the idea of this intervention within the museum that's yeah. challenging the architecture, that's challenging art history. Like, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts about the work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because I was really uh, moved by like a number of different components of the installation and, you know, I guess it's funny because I, the first thing that struck me was really the books for whatever reason. Uh, and it was because so many of them reminded me of the books that not only that I would, some of them are books that I, that I read that I have read for sure. Others are books that I would see like around my house, uh, like my mom's house, I should say. Um, and um and I guess sort of like the collection of books, just there was something about it that I was like, oh, this is something really familiar about this. And then when I learned a bit more about Rashid's story and about the fact that sort of a lot of the books were references to his mom, who was an educator like my mom, that sort of like there was something there that tripped me out. I was like, oh, this is super cool. And then the plants themselves, um, you know, they are obviously such a huge feature of the installation. And um 
again, sort of put me in mind of, uh, of my mom's house and for whatever reason, because she's like big on so many of these. When I look and when I learned about what the plants were, I realized that like yeah, I had seen many of these plants before. These are all plants from the African diaspora, stuff that I would had seen in different places like in Barbados or the Caribbean, et cetera, et cetera. So there was something there that really spoke to me as well. And then the grid itself also uh, was something that um, I'd been really thinking about, particularly through the space syntax lens, because so much of space syntax is about, um, you know, using grids or graphs to be able to understand the relationships between, you know, land uses in cities and between mm. all of these disparate uh, and, and, and sort of quant and, and we really use the grid to be able to quantify these connections. And so when I saw all of these different objects being connected in this way through this, uh, through this frame, it really just sort of spoke to a lot of the way that I see um, like the world, I guess, like in a like metaphor, like sort of like a meta or a metaphor that I use to interpret the world um, in some respects. Uh, and so, yeah, like, you know, there were a lot of different elements that were speaking uh, to me from uh, from, you know, uh, the object perspective. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. And I, I love the idea as well of how do you live within that kind of space? I mean, how do you inhabit? So, I mean, the sculpture is inhabiting the museum. The objects are inhabiting the sculpture. Um, you know, there's all of these. And, and then, of course, we do, too. And, yeah. and our interactions and the fact that we can move through it and that there can be activations within the sculpture itself. There was an interview that I read that really I thought I wanted to share with you. Um, yeah. Rishi Johnson talks about how growing up in Chicago as a young adult, he was fascinated by Carl Andre and that there was a sculpture, it's a minimalist artist and the sculpture is a floor. And when he found out that you could walk on it, he was really amazed. And he mm -hmm. talks about how he went with his friends and they would break dance on Carl Andre's floor. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's so interesting. And in a way, Capsule has that floor <laughs> right. that, you know, is kind of open to a totally different interpretation, totally different um, opportunity for different voices, for different interactions that were not necessarily intended <laughs> by yeah. the artist originally. No, for sure. And I mean, that's a big part of what these installations are about. And I hope they inspire people to come here and engage with the installation in ways that, you know, I am not, um, that I am not animating or can predict. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I think that that's what's good about this. And I hope that like, you know, as people are able to um, gather in indoors and, and to have, and to share co-presence again, that, mm -hmm. you know, that this is the kind of space where people feel like, oh, you know what, you know, through some of the work that we're doing, that they feel like the ice is broken, that, oh, this is a place I can actually just go and hang out and experience this thing. And uh, yeah, and share some time and space with, you know, with all of these objects. Um, I'm feeling very inspired. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, inhabiting uh, this space uh, for, the next few months and and uh and seeing what we create me too i can't wait for the the uh, series to launch mm -hmm. thank thank you so much quende and i hope you enjoyed being in capsule <laughs> i do uh, i have and uh yeah looking forward to the next time see you Jose. fantastic all right take care bye